reading from uh, New King James. But Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verse 24, Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But it, if, if it dies, it produces much grain. And then um, verse 32, it says here that, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. So Jesus must be lifted up and glorified in our lives and through our lives so that people would be drawn to God. All right? So we are the harvest. We are the harvest. But there is a greater harvest coming. A greater harvest coming. Now, the question here I want to ask, are we making ourselves ready for the influx of the later day harvest so that this harvest can be sustained and not fall away? There are so many people that have, um, that have come to know the Lord in 1970s. I don't know about in uh, Uganda, but I... I but in Malaysia, a lot of people came to know God in the 1970s. I know it's, most of you are so young. <laughs> Did you come to know the Lord in 1970s? Mama, Mama Lila? Yeah, okay. Who else came to know the Lord? I mean, okay, Gordon and I, also 70s. Brother Bass? <laughs> Is it 90s? A little, a little part, yeah. A lot. But you know what happened? This uh, big harvest throughout the world was not sustained. Many have fallen away. For the next harvest, the latter day harvest, the church better be ready to sustain and make sure they don't fall away because once we fall away it's harder to bring them back so that's why there's this call of the younger generation and I'm speaking to you younger generation <laughs> we are young at heart we, we claim that too <laughs> the younger generation you have such a big task ahead of you. Not only do you have to bring the older generation from the 1970s back into the kingdom of God, but you have the task of doing it for your generation and the generation after you. Be prepared. Be prepared. For Jesus is our first fruit of salvation. The second feast that is in the summer, the summer feast, the first one, it, um, okay, before I go there, uh, it, this one has only one single feast, and it's called the Pentecost, okay, Pentecost. Now, it teaches um, how to receive power. We had very interesting discussion, I think, um, uh, during one of those uh, Thursday night about the, the Spirit of God within you and the Spirit of God coming upon you. We, we, did, we did, so, you know, if you can come on, please do, you know, come on uh, Thursday nights. You know, we have very good uh, discussion um, on Thursdays. Um, so uh, Psalms 62 verse 11, it says about this receiving power, okay? Psalms 62 verse 11. Sixty-two, verse eleven. It says, "God has spoken once, twice. I have heard this: that power belongs to God." Okay, we not only need God's peace; we need 
we not only need peace with God, but we need His power to break the whole of sin and every self-destructive habits. We have a lot of habits that are actually very destructive to our lives. Sometimes it seems so, you know, um, it doesn't matter. For example, sleep. Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> Some people have problem with sleep. Now, you think there's nothing wrong with sleep, but you know sleep can get you to that place where it can become destructive to you. The Bible says in Proverbs, it says, people who sleep falls a hand. What happens? Poverty sneaks up on them. Sleep. You know, causes all kinds of problems too, you know. Um, I'm not going to go there, otherwise people will think, ouch, 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 you know. <laughs> okay, many believers, okay, we wanna, when we talk about power, many believers want the power of signs, wonders, and miracles. You always say, God, give me this power. You know, I want to work signs and what? Nothing wrong with that. But there is that power that we need to remember that we need so much is the power of God to break the whole of sin and self-destructive, you know, um, habits in our life. You can have all this power. That's why you have, we get disappointed with, with so many you know, powerful men of God that wrought mighty signs, wonders, and miracles. And then, the pa their one part of their life, the power of sin have not broken. And you see them fall. And then you watch this great man of God, and then you think, Oh, that's sad. And some of us get broken hearted. Because like if you're following somebody, you know, you you not following them, but, but you 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 have high esteem for them and then you see this happen. So let us also understand we need to have that power of God to break those chains of self destructive habits and sin in our life. And then when we are um, um, working the powers of God, you know, in mighty signs and wonders, things flow together. Okay? Now, salvation without transformation is a salvation that is questionable. How can you say you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you continue to blatantly sin and not allow the blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit to bring that redemptive work in our lives? When we entered from the kingdom of dark, transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, it means that there is there has to be a change. There has to be a change. Let's move on. Um, the feast of Pentecost marks the end of the Passover season. Okay, there is a transition between um, during this time. There's a transition between two harvests. Okay, the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. The barley represents the Jewish people. All right, the children of Israel, while the wheat represents Gentiles. Now, interestingly, during the Pentecost, two loaves of bread are being waved before God in the temple. One of the loaves is made from barley, and the other one is made from wheat. So what, what, what does it symbolize? It symbolizes that God's congregation is going to be made up of the children of Israel and the Gentile believers. It's going to come together. And God is realigning things. So now, that's why, you know, in, in the first, first uh, part, I talked about how 
amazingly, um, God is built moving in many hearts of the uh, Jewish rabbis. You know, the Messianic um, Jews, they're going to churches now. To many countries, they are going to churches to teach how to go back to the biblical roots. In fact, um, I think it was, uh, I don't know which program, I think um, Brother Nick or uh, Sister Vanita can help me with this. I think it's, um, they, they're calling it the one man, correct? Sick, sick road, one, one new man. So th this is the congregation of God's, the, the, the children of Israel, the Jewish people, with the, uh, the Gentile believers. That is what God is doing right now. Okay? Now, um, an interesting note I want to bring up here is the two loves in comparison to the two tablets of Moses, all right? Uh, I, I know when I talk about this, um, somehow I remember the joke that uh, Gordon was saying, you know, about the two tablets, you know. Mo he said Moses really had a hard time because he had to take two, <laughs> twice. <laughs> and, uh, he had about Noah and all that, <laughs> about the flood. It was so bad that it was a flood, you know. I, I would... <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to go <laughs> into details, but you know, somehow I remember this. But that's not what I want you to remember. <laughs> Aside from that, the children of Israel and the foreigners living together at that time after they came up from Israel, they were given the law through Moses. Okay, So today, God is aligning the people of God, the Jews and the Gentile believers worldwide to walk according to His laws and in the complete work and power of Jesus Messiah. So he's bringing people together. You see, there are a lot of things that are not going to take place, a, tr a, a, a revival that will break out into, throughout the world until the God's people, the, the Jewish people, the, I mean the Jewish believers, not the Jewish people, but Jewish believers and the Gentile believers, when they are able to work together, there is going to be an explosion of revival that we will never have seen yet. So the first Pentecost, you know, I said first Pentecost, you must be thinking, huh? When I first, you know, was taught this, huh? I thought there's only one Pentecost, but there are actually two. Now, the first one happened when Moses was given the Ten Commandments. The children of Israel at that time approached Mount Zion where the fire of God burned. I want to go to, go to um, Hebrews chapter 12, 18, 21. You see, when we talk about Pentecost, we, we think about the fire of God, correct? So let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Um, 18. 18 to 21. Says Hebrews chapter 12. Okay, yes, correct. Okay, for you have not come to the mountain that may be touched, that burn with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. So the power of God was so strong on that mountain that it shook, it shook as God's fire burned upon it. And from out of that, that power of God came the Ten Commandments. Okay? It was so powerful, so powerful. That's why the people did not want to come near and wanted uh, Moses to mediate for them. So, that was the first Pentecost where the 
children of Israel did not want to draw near to God. The second Pentecost is what we, we all know, you know, in, in, the, um, in the Christian world. Um, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all um, with one accord in one place, all in one accord. They were united in vision. They were united, you know, um, in the purposes of God. They were united in spirit. They were in one accord. You know, we can come to Bible, uh, come to pray, but many times we cannot. Sometimes we can, we cannot be united. I mean, we we are not united. We have to think about all this. Yeah, it's good you came for, by, uh, for, for, for prayer meetings, but are we all united in spirit? Are we all united in vision? Are we in one accord? You see, when that happens, something happens. We can see that. It's very clear. You know, sometimes you come to you know prayer meeting. Oh, I don't want. I don't like the way the person is praying. You know, okay, you know, I won't like to pray this way. Oh, I don't like the song. You know, I, and it's like, uh, but there is uh, no, you know, united in unity that God wants. You know, it's not about us. It's about coming before God, in, for you know, in His presence. So uh, we see that it, during the second second Pentecost, they were all in one accord in one place. In one place, you know, you can, there people say, "Oh, you know, I don't want to go to prayer meeting because you know, um, it's okay if I pray at home. Yeah, nothing wrong with that." But there are times when God has called out at assembly, then we need to come as assembly to pray in the presence of God together. So when, when they were together, and suddenly, verse 2, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. I'm trying to imagine this mighty wind. You know, when, when Rita came through, I, I've never heard such wind. It was, whoa. They, they say there were, it was like a train, you know, I, of, well, it wasn't that bad in, in our area because it hit something else. But the wind itself, I remember, Floria, you just came, right? You were telling me about how scared we were and you called your mom, right? <laughs> something like that. But I can imagine this rushing of mighty wind. What is it like during that time? And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The fire on the Mount Sinai was the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's not just an ordinary fire. It was the presence of the Holy Spirit. This fire from the mountain on the, this day, the first Pentecost, came upon, uh, on this day, the second Pentecost, came upon the believers and moved right into their hearts. That's how powerful it was. That's why Peter could stand up and preach. After betraying Jesus, he was so afraid. But after this, the fire of God went straight into his heart. There was power, and he was able to preach to a multitude. And in fact, his preaching brought the first 3,000 converts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, the difference of the, mount, the, 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 the God's power displayed at the mountain, it's different because they were so afraid, you know, it, it, they didn't want it. They didn't want it. What can we say about so many people who don't want the experience of the second Pentecost experience? Think about that. 
Whenever and wherever there is a fire of the Holy Spirit descending upon believers with the evidence of speaking in tongues, it is a mini Pentecost all over again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the Pentecost did not end with the Pentecost that we know. Every time there is a gathering of believers and the Spirit of God showed up this way, it is another one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm so excited talking about this today. The, last, the first part, I'm like, <laughs> but today I'm so fired up. And it's funny because today I'm actually sick. <laughs> but, you know, but God touched me this morning and wow. Hallelujah. Prophetically, we are in God's times table in the summer feast. We are in that timetable. That's why we see what we are seeing today, the move of the Spirit of God. But it's not in its fullness yet. And um, the, um, the prophetic time of the fall feast is coming, and that, that is the time where God starts judging we see a little bit of that already so it's like in the prophetic times table of God we are moving closer to the fall feast Hebrews chapter 12 you know, same um, same passage but um, uh, verses uh, 25 to 29. Hebrews chapter 12, uh, 20, uh, 25 to 29. Okay. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refuse him who spoken of, much more shall we not escape. How much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven? So even the, 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 you know, the, the beginning scripture that you read, you know, talks about the voice of God. So you, you see there the connection, how God, you know, uh, leads the, the, the service. Verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, and now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. You know, you, you hear so much now in the news about this, uh, they are concerned about this, uh, what do you call those? Meteorites? Kristen, what do you call those big stuff coming? Astrolites? Astro? Huh? Yeah, but you see they are concerned about all these things, you know. Um, they're saying it's going to happen in a few hundred years or something like that. But I don't know, you know, when God speaks. When God speaks. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken. As of those things that are made, that the, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. What is in your life? What is in your life? The things that are going to be shaken. Verse 28, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. There are three purposes of God's holy fire. Okay, The first one is his fire is to burn out the sin in our life and burn a hedge of protection around us. We want a hedge of protection around us, but you know what? I think in one of my teaching, we can make holes in our, our hedge by the sins that we allow in our lives. So God wants this, this uh, have this fire that burns out sin ar inside our lives so that we have this hedge of protection around us. And we were praying on a Thursday night about the wall of fire. That's what the hedge of protection is. You know, if I have a wall, I, I believe I have a wall of fire around me. And you know, to, ha to have such a hedge over us, wow, 
That's some protection. Anything that comes near get burned and consumed by the fire of God. Don't we want to be in that place? Wow. Hallelujah. The second purpose of this holy fire is that it provides a powerful witness, you know, f- to those around, you know, the through signs and wonders of who Jesus really is. That's why signs, wonders, and miracles are such awesome witness of God's power, of who Jesus is, of what he has done. He destroyed the works of the enemy. Third purpose his fire in the world judges and destroys satanic strongholds, spiritual and physical. So there's that fire that's coming that is going to destroy satanic strongholds. But as, as if you read some more, you know, uh, in the Word of God, Revelation, and certain parts about the last time, last days, you see, as God begin to do this, destroying the strongholds of satanic strongholds, you begin to see the activity, the increased activity of Satan in this world too. So that's why you have increased evil, wickedness that. You know, some of us have, you know, have not known. Okay, moving on to the third feast. And the third feast is in the autumn, okay, and it's called the Tabernacles. Um, included in this feast is the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacle. So this feast, this autumn feast is to teach us how to enter into God's rest. Now, we already said that there's a constant war of, uh, you know, on our souls. So the Tabernacle, the Feast of Tabernacle actually teaches us, help us to find rest of God for our souls. You know, I was a very troubled child growing up. So much trouble, you know. And I, c- I could never, I never had a day where I knew rest until I understood what Jesus did for me on the cross. Every day there was something going on inside of me. And I would sit in a corner and allow that you know, don't, don't know how to control it. I don't know how. The raging war inside my soul, I did not find rest. So, so to find that rest today that I know it is so precious, but the enemy always tries to t- steal it again and again. But we need to know how to stand in the rest of God for the rest of our lives on earth. Okay, the Feast of Trumpet, quickly. Now, the Feast of Trumpet is, uh, you know, it, they call it the sofa. Um, the, the Day of Trumpets, is co- it's a call from heaven, okay? It's a call from heaven. Uh, when they blow this, you know, they, they're, you know, usually when they blow this in, in the in, in Feast, you know, it's, it's, it's like God is going to make an announcement, okay? It's a time when heaven is going to speak. So during this time, if those, if you, we are sensitive in the Holy Spirit, you will begin to hear him clearly during this time period. He, God will begin to give insight to his people to prepare for the next year. And that's why you see uh, during this time, a lot of prophets, you know, the prophets, the, the, um, uh, the well-known prophets of God in America during this time, they really seek God. And that's why they are able to tell, help the church to understand what is going on in the next year. But we don't have to just depend on them. If only we believers, where we are, know how t- to, to go into this feast, you know, understand this time and begin to hear God for our families. You see, the, a lot of these uh, prophets, they hear from the nation, but we in, in we ha- being in our own family. We need to hear what God is saying for our family. We need insight. We need to know how to prepare for what is going to happen for our family. And that's why it's so important to hear God. There are three themes uh, concerning this day of trumpet. Okay, I've mentioned this in... uh, 
in my sermon called The Bride Made Herself Ready. So I'm not going to cover too much of this. So um, there are three, uh, three themes, that kingships, marriage, and resurrection. Okay? So kingship. Kingship is, that we, like I said, we are rehearsing to the day when Jesus is going to come as a king. The Day of t Atonement, I'm going to move quickly to the Day of Atonement because I've covered a lot of that um, in uh, the sermon called um, The Bride Made Himself Ready. The Day of Atonement is called Yom Kippur. Um, that was uh, just, uh, I think, two weeks ago. No, it was last week. And this is, a, it, this is a solemn day, and it comes with a warning for this day. Um, it says that um, in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 29, um, you don't have to go there, but uh, you can pull up the verse up there. Uh, Leviticus uh, 23, 29, it, in this, it says that we need to afflict one's souls. What does it mean? Why do we have to afflict one's souls? That the warning is here. Because if we don't put away the things that are pleasurable but abominable to the Lord, we will be cut off from his people. That is how serious it is. To be cut off from his people, we don't want that. We don't want to be cut off from God's people. Now, There is the prophetic significance of the day of the Lord. Okay, this uh, day of atonement is a prophetic significant that it is a divine rehearsal for the day of the Lord. I think um, um, Sister Brenda was preaching about uh, what's that first sermon you preached that um, perhaps this day, perhaps today. I think she talked a lot about the day of the Lord. Right. So, so this um, uh, you know I'm listening to every preaching. Hallelujah. How awesome. How awesome God has raised different people up in this message. And every time we, you know, people think about Sister Josephine, you know, we will remember that constipation. That's an awesome word of God. <laughs> so different people have, you know, God just uses different people to bring a certain key word and then we remember it. Hallelujah. God has raised so many of you up. I'm just rejoicing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, everybody say, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay, Revelation 19, 11 to 16. Um, now you think about the day of the Lord. Uh, let's look at uh, Revelation chapter 19, 11 to 16. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. And we think we knew all the names of God, but there is one name here only he know he was clothed with a robe deep in blood and his name is called the word of god and the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen white and clean followed him out on white horses now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that he with it should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of God, and he has on his robe and on his tie a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This of all days, the day of atonement, this of all days is to get us to humble ourselves before God because we are approaching the judgment bar of the Almighty. The Feast of Tabernacle. Um, we are in this season right now. Mm, it started October 12th, so they... They are celebrating it for at least, I think, seven to eight days. Traditionally, this is what the, the Jewish people, they will move out of their own homes, and then they will live in little tents, you know, temporary shelter called sukkah. This, 
this is to help them remember that you know they they're wandering in the wilderness and for us as believers we need to understand that we are just on a pilgrimage this world is not our home i used to sing this song this world is not my home i'm just a passing through and my, one my i remember the dean of the college one day could not stand it because i sang it almost every day she just stopped singing it. we're s- singing this song we're still on earth <laughs> <laughs> but it reminded me that I, this world is not my home. Everything is temporary. Um, so every believer must acknowledge their need for God and his desire to tabernacle in with his people. And I think we, we talked quite a bit about it in uh, one of our uh, Thursday uh, night. You know, we talk about how God wanting to tabernacle with his people. All right. Um, um, Revelation 21, verse 3 to 8. Um, but I'm just going to read verse 3. Mm, and I heard a loud voice um, in heaven, from heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And if you look, you know, all through that, uh, the rest of the passage, you see that there is a complete and true rest in God when, you know, there'll be no crying, you know, everything is just nice. That is true rest. And in verse 8, it says, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderous, sexually immoral, and all that uh, wickedness shall have no part in it, but will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So from all this, um, from the, the, law of the, the law of the first mention that was in uh, part one, we realize that God had made this feast as an everlasting ordinance. So based on the law of first mention, God never changed it. Jesus never replaced it. That means we cannot ignore the significance of the feast of the Lord, okay? Because the life, it, 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 it includes, you know, it, it envelops the life of a believer. It's all related to Jesus Messiah, all right? So, from from him, what he has already done, the continuing work of the Holy Spirit and his his reign, they are all connected. So the annual cycle of the feast serves as a reminder, a rehearsal, and a preparation for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Hallelujah.